Good afternoon. Hello, all. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Jeff Jarvis, for those of you who aren't from the school. Uh, and I want to make absolutely clear that this was not Graciela's idea. Um, it was my idea, because uh, not just because I'm sucking up to the new boss. Uh, I have tenure, so I don't have to do things like that. <laughs> but um, uh, I read Graciela's wonderful book, The Prophet of the Andes. And uh, I actually listened to it first. And then heard Graciela speak about it uh, to uh, Brian Lehrer at WNYC, and then at the New York Public Library. And what occurred to me was that there were all kinds of journalistic decisions that went into this that I thought would be of value to our school to talk about and to hear. Uh, so that's what led to uh, today's event. Um, so uh, you all know Graciela Moskovsky, our new dean here at the school. And day 99. Day 99. Tomorrow is day 100, so we can all judge her administration <laughs> uh, as journalists do. Uh, so, Graciela, why don't you start by, uh, I know that everyone here wants to read the book, uh, but of course we keep them too busy studying, so they can't yet. Uh, when you do, you can get it from our library or from the New York Public Library as well. But why don't you just describe the, um, the story, the plot of the book, as it were. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for, for coming. I know you're very busy in the middle of the semester. And it, this was absolutely Jeff's idea. I'm not here to promote my book. Um, but I do think that I hope you will find some of the decisions I made in, you know, in the reporting part of the process and the writing and um, useful. And so the this is the story. I have a very long answer, but I'll do the short one, of course. It's the story of a um, Peruvian um, carpenter who uh, lived in a very isolated uh, area of the Andes in the north of Peru in the 1940s, and his father was murdered, and uh, he found a Bible, a Protestant Bible, hidden in a trunk um, when he was going through his father's uh, things. And uh, he started reading this book. By then, 95% of Peru was Catholic, and people didn't read the book. Um, people went to mass, the mass was in Latin, so he had never read this book as a book, and he started, he started reading the book, and he that triggered or started in him a conversion process that took him from the Catholic Church where he had been born, in which he had been born, to um, Protestant churches that were just arriving in Peru. He chose the Seventh-day Adventist um, movement and then a radical group within that church. Then he moved, uh, 100 followers into the Amazon jungle and started his own church. And when he was there in the late 60s, he discovered Judaism through a series of fantastic accidents. And um, he decided they were Jewish. And so they started living as Jewish uh, with the help only of books. And for 20 years, they live as Orthodox Jews in the coast of Peru. Um, they moved again in the, in, the, in the Pacific coast. And then finally, they were um, they were contacted by a group of rabbis who converted them in the late 80s and brought them to Israel. Uh, well, not to, 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 the, to the settlements in the West Bank. And so they became settlers um, in, around, uh, in the north of the West Bank. And um, that's basically the story. And he brought uh, hundreds of people with him, a few hundred with him. And that's kind of the core of the story. Then there's more twists. It's, it's a story that is full of twists and turns, as, as you know. And it has an epilogue that is very important. But that's basically the, the, the main story. And this, this person, this man's name was Segundo Villanueva. He died in 2008, and he's buried in the Mount of Olives Cemetery. Um, at one level, this is a book about the book, the book, a book about uh, the word about reading. I think you said you, your original title for the book was going to be what? The Readers. The Readers. Um, it's a book about finding authority, finding a higher truth. At another level, it's an extremely human story with a lot of wonderful anecdotes in it, if I may. I'm going to, since you didn't, I'll do it. Um, uh, the only books they could get a hold of were books meant to prepare children for bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah, right? And so out of that, they developed and followed the rituals that they believed were the right rituals, which is really kind of charming. The other scene that got me was when they decided that they had to get circumcised. And there were men kind of 
wriggling on the floor after that happening. Um, and the whole process of conversion, there's just all kinds of, as Graciela said, twists and turns in this. Where I'd like to start, because we believe that one of the key skills we teach here at a journalism school is knowing what a story is, right? You've all heard us lecture about that. Um, so the beginnings of how you found the story, uh, and then we'll get into the reporting. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm from Argentina originally, I guess everyone knows here, or most, most of you. And um, I found the story in 2003. I was in Buenos Aires at home. I had just finished a book that would make my name as a writer, um, as an author, and I was a political reporter. I covered the government, uh, and I had been a political reporter for years. And so I was not a religious reporter. Uh, there's no such thing really as religious reporting in Argentina. As some, it, there's no career or uh, many outlets doing that, and I was not. And usually, re religion is covered from a sociological perspective. You know, the poor have religions, and that's part of how they're covered. Um, but not as you know, the you know, humanity seek, you know, seeking, you know, a, a man seeking for truth or meaning. Um, so I, fa I was I was looking for something else. I'm I'm the daughter of a Jewish man and a Catholic woman. My mom is from Paraguay. She's um, an observant Catholic, and my father is an atheist Jew. And I was trying to read more about um, Judaism in Latin America and that specific experience of being um, of, of, of Judaism, being Jewish or half Jewish, in a very Catholic region. And and um, and I found this I, I found this letter from a rabbi. You know, like things get tossed into the internet, like they're navigating there, and then years later you you find the thing. Um, and this was an old letter that a rabbi had posted asking for donations for this community. And the title of the letter caught my attention because it was um, uh, it was converting Inca Jews in Peru. And I, th I said, what's an Inca Jew? That makes no sense. <laughs> and, and so I clicked. And uh, the letter was riddled with errors, then I learned, and, and exaggerations. And it wasn't, um, th there was a lot of in it that wasn't Right, uh, but the main story of Segundo was there in that letter. And at the bottom of the letter, there was a phone number for people in Monse, New York. I didn't know that was. It's one of these Hasidic towns upstate in upstate New York, and asking for donations. It was his, the rabbi's personal phone number for people who wanted to donate for this community. So I had just quit a job as a political reporter in one of Argentina, the Buenos Aires main newspapers. My book was about to come out. I, I didn't have anything to do except because I got a good severance payment, so I could just I was just looking for my next project, and uh, and I called and um, I got the widow of the rabbi. The rabbi had died. The widow was one of the converts, a Peruvian convert, much younger, who had survived him, and she somehow thought I had an accent, and <laughs> she's just switched into Spanish Im immediately, and we started talking, and she gave me all the phone numbers for the family of Segundo and Segundo who were living in um, in Tapuaj, in this uh, settlement in the West Bank. And and then my, you know, this is probably TMI, but you know, it, it can help you if, you're, if, if you find yourself in this situation. I had been overpaid, which never happens, by my employer. They had deposited $5,000 by mistake in my account. So I just realized that that day, so I ran to the ATM. I don't know why I went to the ATM. I took the money. <laughs> and I bought a ticket to Israel, <laughs> and I thought, you know, I just, uh, they didn't deserve it. Uh, so, and I just, two weeks later, I was in Tapuach, just, and I spent the next um, 15 years following this story, and, um, and that allowed me to just, you know, go um, to, to, start, to start the reporting for the story. So, I mean, how many days after you first read this did you end up in, in Israel? Uh, two weeks. Two weeks. So you have to move fast. <laughs> what was it that made you believe it was worth that investment, that risk of, of you know, even though it wasn't fully your money, <laughs> it was the, the papers, uh, but you could have you could have bought a you know a, a, a nice car with it or a down payment on it. Yeah. Instead, you chose to put that toward this trip. Uh, what was the voice inside your head that said there's something bigger here? There's a story here. What did you think it was going to be then? I don't think like that. I just, uh, I'm, I trust my instinct, and sometimes it, the instinct is completely wrong, but 90% of the times 
it has worked out well. Um, I just thought, wow, this is amazing. I don't have a job, I have this money. I had a severance payment that meant they would continue to pay my salary. In Argentina, there's really good laws to protect journalists so far. They're not gonna last much, I don't think so. But uh, so they would just keep paying my salary for a year. So I could do, I felt I could do whatever I wanted and I wanted to do this story. And I didn't know whether this was going to be, I didn't know what it was. It, maybe it was a story, maybe it was just an article, maybe it was a book. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't have a risk, uh, my, my risk assessment threshold is very high. <laughs> so I just, I didn't know. And I think that's what happens, right? When you're looking for a story and you are in the initial stages, you have a sense that, you know, when you have that feeling that th there's something here that is re really a great story because it's just so, in this case, so unusual and so different from everything I've written about. And I really want to know how did, how did they do this? Just from, how do you go from this hamlet in the Andes, this very re remote area where, you know, um, there's not, you know, fr from there to how do you become a, a Jewish settler in the West Bank in, you know, in your lifetime? And I thought that was really, I just wanted to know more, but I didn't know, maybe it was just a trip. And then, I mean, I was just going to learn about something I didn't know anything about. And I'm, I'm also very, I'm compelled, I, I find stories I don't no I know nothing about very compelling. Uh, those are my favorite ones when I really know nothing and I'm going to have to learn everything from scratch about, you know, religious Judaism, about Hebrew, about Israel, about the settlements, about Peru and Peruvian history, about how, you know, I, I, I thought that was really interesting and I just wanted to know more. I'm still gonna press though, was there a moment, so if it wasn't when you got off the phone or if it wasn't when you got on the plane, was there a moment when you said, hell yeah, this is a story or this is a book or whatever, what, what, that, that crystallization of a story, yeah. when did that come to you? When you get access in this case, so when I went there and I talked, he was not, Segundo was not in Tapua when I arrived. I called his, daughters and they were very excited that somebody was interested about them and, in, and could they could talk Spanish with someone. And so because they'd been in, in by then they'd been in, in this settlement, uh, in, in a few settlements since this was 2003 and they have moved in, 90, in 1989, so 1990. So they had been there for a very long time and so this Argentine stranger just calls to, you know, and says, you know, I, I think that's, can I visit? You have a great story, I'd like to hear more. And they were very happy. They asked me to bring um, mandioca, yuca, yucca, in my, like four kilos, because uh, it was the holidays and they hadn't tasted it. And in Argentina, you can get it. So they were very excited that I was visiting. And I spent, you know, those two weeks going back and forth and talking to other people. And I realized they were going to talk to me. Little did I know that they were not going to talk to me, th these specific women. But I thought, um, I talked to Segundo's son. Segundo was back in Peru for very reasons that I learned later. Um, but then when I came back to Buenos Aires, I thought, I knew that that was a story, but you know, it's really hard to, for all of those who come not from this country and not from a country with um, a relatively wealthy journalism industry, even though it's less wealthy here than it was in the past, but there's still a lot of resources, there's grants, fellowships, you know, there's organizations that can help you fund trips and do international reporting. If you are in, in Buenos Aires, there's nothing like that. No, one, no one's gonna fund you. You have to basically work to save the money to fund your, yourself, to fund your investigation. So I just, my concern then was how am I going to be spending time in Peru, in Israel, in the settlements from Buenos Aires? It's also far, everything is expensive and far. So my concern was, how am I gonna fund this? Um, and, uh, and that's why it took so long, because it was really hard to fund. How many trips did you take to the reporting? A, a lot, I did, I spent, um, but, it, but it took like a year every time just to save money for the trip. So I finally went back to, I went to Peru. So in 2003, I went to Israel for the first time. 2004, I managed to spend two months in Peru. 2005, I could go back for two or three weeks to Israel. And then 2006, I went back to Peru. And then 
I stopped, I did other books and other things in my life, and then I went back in 2000, like 15, and uh, to Peru, and then three more times to Peru, and then two more times, I think, to Israel. And they say that journalists have a short attention span. Um, this obviously got into your soul. That I think it must have been a point where you said, I have to do this. I've invested so much in it, there's so much there. Um, I want to hit on the religion reporting because I found this fascinating. Um, you you learned some Hebrew. So what do you call if, if the Spanglish is Spanish and English? What is it? What is Spanish and Hebrews? Hebrew? I don't know. It doesn't have a name. Doesn't have a name. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so rare is it? Um, so you learned some Hebrew. But what really impressed me, uh, I'm the I'm the brother of a minister. Um, I'm the fallen one. Um, and so the depth of studying that you did in the, into the Gospels and the Old Testament um, is really impressive. And uh, it's, a, it's a part of the understanding you had to have to tell the story, but it's not like you had a chapter saying, now I'm gonna explain all this to you, right? It's just, it's just ingrained in it. And you had to know how much research you had to do. And I think for a lot of people, that would be off-putting to just say, oh hell, I'm gonna learn some Hebrew. I'm gonna dig into the Bible. When you were not raised, you were raised Catholic, but not terribly religiously, right? How did you know the mountain you had to climb then? Did you know how big that mountain was? Well, in that case, so when I was, when I started, I started doing this book and I was doing another book at the same time, a book about the Spanish Civil War and um, an uncle of mine, an uncle of my, my father's uncle who had fought for the Republic in the Spanish Civil War. And I wanted to tell the story of the Argentine involvement in the Spanish Civil War through my great uncle. Um, and so I also was you know, trying to do that story mostly in Argentina. And r I read a book, I, I was still not sure whether I could do this other book. It was kind of there, I kept talking to people. I would call them all the time, just keep in touch. You know, when you develop sources, it takes time. So I would, you know, even if you can't travel, there's the phone and email, and I would just you know, constantly talk to them and start reading more about them. And then I read this book about a scholar, an American uh, professor who had done this great book about the Spanish Civil War. And, and he, in the, in the prologue, he, he told the story of how when he started, when he, dis he needed to decide what his PhD project was gonna be or something like that. And he realized he wanted to write about the Spanish Civil, Civil War and the Russian um, involvement, which is of course a huge story. And, but he didn't speak Russian. And so I was in Buenos Aires where, you know, there's limited, you know, it's a, there's limited possibilities for international reporting again. And I read the story of this guy who decided he was gonna start study Russian first, the language, master Russian, and then he was going to, so it took him 10 years to just get the language. And then he did this, uh, this amazing book and he was a scholar whose expertise was this Russian involved. And I thought, you can do it, you know, this is doable. You know, someone else did it. I'm just going to do it. You know, you, I don't, I studied, so I just, I just went looking for a, for a more, which is a he Hebrew teacher, and there's plenty in Buenos Aires. In Buenos Aires is a very Jewish city in the way New York is a Jewish city. So we do have a long, a long um, you know, tradition and a very strong um, Jewish life in Argentina, which is different from Peru and most Latin American countries. Uh, where Jewish communities are very small and more isolated. Um, Argentina used to have the third largest Jewish community in the world after Israel and the US, and it's still very large. And, and my story is very common, you know, you have a Jewish last name, but your mom is a Catholic, and you know, there's, a lot, there's been a lot of intermarriage. And, and so I thought, so I, I started taking Hebrew lessons. Uh, I studied for two years. For the life of me, I can't speak Hebrew. So if you speak Hebrew, don't think you can say something because I'll say, "Ani <laughs> lome <laughs> You know, I just. But it helped me enough. It was enough for me to understand the structure of the language and to understand because my my you know the, this 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 um, all the converts already spoke Hebrew and were fluent in Hebrew. But they also, when they spoke in Spanish, they spoke uh, a, a Spanish that was completely you know, in, interspeded with, with Hebrew words because there were things they could only say in Hebrew. They couldn't say them in Spanish because they didn't make sense in Spanish to them. So I needed to have enough Hebrew to, to understand those conversations and to know that koba was a hat, you know, things like that. Um, so it, it, it helped with that. Um, 
So what was your question? <laughs> just that, just that, I mean, was there a point which you said, no, I, I, this is too, I can't, to oh, tell this story properly, no, I God, I'd have to do no. too much. I'd have no, to go to seminary. What, right, the, what, so, because I didn't think like that as a mature person, I actually wrote the book before I was ready to answer all those questions. So I did a first version, a verse, a first uh, failed version of the book, I'm, I'm sad to admit. So I, the a first version of this book was published in 2006. I in Spanish, in Argentina, it's called La Revelación, The Revelation. And uh, not, nothing happened with that book. Everybody kindly and just ju just gently ignored it. And um, they were like, okay, you know, she's, you know, she's a political writer. What's, what's she doing writing about, you know, a religious story? So there was also no market for that book in, in Buenos Aires at the time. But it was, a, it was really a failed attempt because I did not have the, the deeper understanding on religious history and what this story meant in that context. So to me, it was, m it was mostly just the story of this man and this community and what they did. And that, that, that was a very important lesson to me when you, when you tell a story, because you have enough to tell the story of, you know, of, of, a, of a person or of a group or, or a phenomena, but you don't really have enough understanding of what it means in, the, in, the, in a historical context or a political context even if you're not gonna write about the political context or the religious context, and you're gonna just be laser focused on the one person, if you don't have that in your, if, if that's not in the background, then the story falls flat, it's like flat. It's like you don't have a, a landscape that makes it come to life. And so to me it was very important once I did it and it came out, and it, the reason it came out is that I needed to sell that book because I, I had run out, no, one's gonna, no one was paying me anymore. So I needed, I decided I was gonna be a book writer and make a living out of that, um, which uh, didn't really happen. Um, but I've, I've done seven books in the meantime, so it, it, it was good professionally. It was, it was, I, I was very happy doing that. I, I just love the long form process. I love the, you know, I complain when I'm doing this and I lie, I'll say I hate it. But I actually love the challenge, the kind of the marathon aspect of it instead of just a quick run. Um, but so I, I did it and it w I had this kind of uh, bitter feeling that I had not made them, I felt bad about them because I felt I didn't make this justice and I, the story was not, there was so much more to this story than what I, so what happened is that um, I did two, three books later and a child later. And uh, 2013, I got a fellowship in the New York Public Library, uh, the Coleman Fellowship. And uh, with this project, I said, I'm gonna try again. And if I get the fellowship, maybe I can do this book properly. But I just didn't have the resources from Buenos Aires to do it properly. Also, I didn't have access to the readings, uh, to the libraries, you know. I don't know if anyone here understands the, what it means to have a country where libraries are you know, just where there's this investment, even if you think this country has disinvested in public libraries, there's still this amazing, you know, um, you can get any books in the world mostly, you know, in, in the New York Public Library and, and other libraries, and so that has a, a huge value. One of my books, um, the book about my great uncle, I needed documents from, for about the, you know, the army, the, the uh, from, from the army about how the army reacted to the civil, um, Spanish Civil War and there had been something there that I wanted to know. And so I finally got access to the archive of the, of the, na the Navy, it was the Navy. And so I went to the Navy and um, they took me to their archives and a typical Argentine archive, they just opened the door to this basement. Nobody had opened this door in years. And it's completely, it's flat, there's rats fr just swimming. <laughs> and I see all this paper just completely just you know, in this water, and uh, and that's how they realized they actually had lost their archive and everything was lost, you know. So now when I go to libraries and the documents are there and they are still there, I, I just I have this like PTSD moment that I want to start crying, like oh my god, people keep archives and documents, and so for a journalist and a book writer, that's incredibly valuable, right? So I thought I'll try to get this fellowship, and if I get it. I have just one year just to do the reading. I, f I felt I had done the reporting, though I still did a lot of more reporting, but I, I needed to do the reading. I needed to read about the history of conversion. Was this completely unusual in the history of 
and it was it kind of was because this was a mass unmediated conversion which is not usual in in the life in the history of Judaism um, how about the relationship between the when did the Protestant churches started arriving in the continent and was what was the relationship of what was the experience of the Seventh-day Adventist in Peru which was a huge story by the way that I knew nothing about you know what you know how well then you know and, and then just to complicate it more just to read about you know, part of what the decisions they made had to do with the political and economic history of Peru. So at one point, there's to me one of the most moving parts in, in their stories when they're trying to build a synagogue because they realize they decide they want to be Jewish and they, want they, they, they learned that they needed to have, to live a proper Jewish life, religious Jewish life. They needed a synagogue and they needed um, a Sefer Torah, you know, a, 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 a they needed this, this very extensive book. Um, and or parchment and then they needed um, they needed to gather in this place so they're very poor and it takes them years I, f I found they had they kept um, um, minutes of their meetings as an organization and there's a there's for years they meet every month to discuss how are they going to raise money to build this synagogue and they finally after a year get money for a wall and then they finally they can make another wall and then another wall and for years they don't have a roof and in the winter it's really, you know, it's really difficult because it's so cold. And then they finally get a roof but when they get the money for the roof there's this, it's the 80s in Peru, that was the lost decade um, in Latin America. There's this incredible, you know, there's inflation in the 5,000 a year, you know, percentage of inflation and everything, ev you know, money, you know, as an Argentine I can relate with that feeling but money loses value by the minute. You know, you finally have the money and then the next day you can't buy even half of you what you could buy the day before. So you, you see the roof just, you know, kind of disappearing in front of their eyes and, and then they try again and they try again and they finally get a roof and then they need windows and, and it's years of that. And I thought that was really um, moving and, and, and really it was really, I thought this is part of the story this book is telling, this story about determination and perseverance and just, you know, uh, trying and I felt in a way I was just doing the same with the story and with the book and so I came, so finally got the fellowship. I spent a year reading and talking to scholars and talking to experts. There's ex experts on any everything in this country and they really know their thing because everyone is so specialized. So I did, um, and then so since 2013 until it came out in August. So it was a long, you know, process. Yeah, I, one of my great embarrassments as a journalist was I didn't value academic papers and, and the wealth of libraries and being here and having the wealth available to us is just a blessing that I never fully understood and grasped. And I also hear what you're talking about now. Your, your strategy for the school comes into clearer light too because you value history and context and research. I want to switch topic a little bit. Um, first, uh, if you would, what you tell in your introduction about your father uh, being atheist Jew and your mother being observant Catholic and your relation and how it affected your relationship, especially with him. Would you just do that for a second and then I'll ask a question. So that's the only pl place in, when in which you'll find me um, uh, in the book. It's just this author's note where I I was not going to write the author's note. This was actually um, my editor's suggestion and one very smart reader who read the first manuscript in Spanish. And they both say, because the book starts, the book is the story I told you, and it goes to the present day, but it starts in um, the 16th century in Cajamarca when the Spaniards come and make everyone, everyone a Catholic, right? And uh, so it's the arrival of the Bible in, in that town, and that's exactly the town in which Segundo was born. And where this, so everyone was like, by the time people get through the conquest, <laughs> you know, you need to tell them where they're going, because it takes a while. And the first half of the book has no Jewish history in it. The first half, it's within Christianity. And then they found Judaism by half through it. And then the second half is their, st their, their story as Jews. Um, so everybody felt like there was something needed there, something, t uh, you know, just a, no a note, a, a, a preface, a prologue, something where I would say um, where this was going. And so I inserted myself there and I basically explained. Everybody was also, so why is this important to you? I think 
uh, not, modern nonfiction is so preoccupied with the author and the motivations, I thought, fine, I'll say it. Um, so basically, I, I said that, you know, I probably, and this is of course true, the, the reason I found it so compelling at the beginning also was because, it, because of how it related to my own, own personal story with religion and how, so my father, my parents kind of split, we are four uh, children and my mom had me and my baby brother when he was born after a very difficult labor um, process. Um, uh, baptized, I was nine, and then I was sent to nun school, which I didn't like. And my other, my other brothers kind of stayed on the atheist um, camp, and then and one of them decided also to be baptized. Uh, but for years, so I was, you know, I was raised as a Catholic since I was nine, and until I finished high school, and then I, I abandoned religion. Uh, so this is not the book of a religious person at all. Um, but my father, and so I was very close to my father's family. My mom's family lived in Paraguay, so we never really saw them much. And my father's family was the family that was my family, and all my cousins and everyone. And so, and my grandmother would always say nosotros, I, us, when she meant the Jewish part. And it really pay. It was really like a, you know, like like a little bit of stabbing every time she said nosotros, and I was like. I'm nosotros, you know, I'm, I'm also part, but, you know, because I, we didn't do Rosh Hashanah, we didn't do the, you know, the, we didn't do bar mitzvahs, and so there was something, you know, there was a separation in a way, something that was mine but was not mine, I was not Jewish, I am not Jewish, but that was really dear to me, and so, but then at the same time, I was sent to this nun school where I was told when I was 10, I didn't know this, um, that if you're not baptized, you burn in hell, or and so I thought, my father is not baptized. So I tried for more than a year to, to get my father to, be, to get baptized cynically. I said, doesn't matter if you don't believe. You just need, I just want you saved and, uh, you know, just get. And he was like, but I'm Jewish. I can't get baptized. And so I did try to convert him for a while. And I failed, thank God. Um, and, um, and so I just, you know, I, there's kind of a, a, a reference to that. And then when I... In the context of meeting these uh, Segundo's daughters, who had actually for so long fought to be accepted as Jewish, by the time I met them, and because everyone assumed, because they looked, um, they you know they were brown and they looked like mestizos, uh, in 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 Israel they were not seen as Jewish and they had not been accepted as Jewish because of their ethnicity and their mostly their class, back in Peru. And so it was about, you know, and, and everyone always assumes I'm Jewish because in Argentina, my last name is very Jewish sounding. And so I thought they had, you know, a relatable experience in a way. So this is what I want to press you on. I know it's a question you don't like, but, I, but I, um, I've heard you say Bashing this in previous men. interviews. But were I your editor, which is never going to happen, I would have said, Geez, Graciela, there's a, there's a string here of your own relationship with this and, and discovery and doubt and choosing to seek or not to seek that I would have thought would have been a thread through the entire book. And so, so today's about journalistic decisions and narrative decisions. You, it, to me, it would have been just such an, an, an obvious and easy string to weave through the story and you obviously were adamant not to do that because putting it in at all was practically an afterthought that you were forced into. Mm -hmm. Why did you leave yourself out of the book? What was the, what was the reason you decided to do that? I, I felt I couldn't compare myself with Segundo. Like he had done this extraordinary thing. And I don't, I have to say, I, didn't, I don't agree. And throughout the process, I never agreed with his politics. With his, he's a much more conservative person than I am. Um, he ended up being a settler, which I wouldn't be. He, he was machista, you know, he's of a generation where women have very, very little uh, space in this story because they were not given the space. And, um, and so, but I felt that I, I was really, I really admired uh, his, 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 he was a free thinker. He was a guy who thought he could, you know, he didn't need anyone to tell him what, life meant and what God meant that he was going to find it by himself and by, by community. He, he did all this, you know, seeking through a group of Bible readers and, dis and discussions and that were quite democratic. Um, so I felt, you know, what, 
what happened to me, my grandma said, nosotros, and she didn't include, I felt like I had not gone through any of the hardship. And um, it was really, really hard for them. They were rejected by most of these groups. Oftentimes, they were rejected by the local Jews in Lima, always till today. They were not, you know, it took them, they made so many sacrifices. Um, there was also a class thing, which I find tricky. And I, you know, I'm always very aware about, I was always, as a reporter in Argentina, aware that I was a middle class um, reporter um, who I covered crime and poverty for a long time. And I found it very troubling how journalism covered those stories and those communities, how condescending it was. And these people were uh, poor, and I did not want to insert myself. I just really want them to have all the agency and just to talk about them. I, I felt, and they come from a very, and that's how, this, how the story begins. There's a colonial, you know, situation in which, you know, the Spanish came, you know the story, and, um, you know, they just, you know, 80% of that people disappeared in the next decades. And then they just, you know, force this religion on these people. And they are still very much the result of that experience in a way, um, you know, the, the, the way class division divide works in Peru, for example. And so I wanted to be very um, careful not to, um, just to focus on, on them and to really try to understand and and in some works, in some in some books, it really works when the author kind of guides you through. In the the the, the book with my great grandfather, uh, great uncle, sorry, with my great uncle, I am. Uh, it's it's my reporting to find. It's like the detective story, like the typical nonfiction. Like I'm looking, I'm I'm out there just seeking, looking for him, and I find him at the end. So I'm I'm comfortable writing about myself. It's not that I don't, um, but I didn't think I I didn't think it was the right choice for this book. I have a few more questions, then I won't come into the room, I promise. Um, the other journalistic decision you made that I think was so critical here was the voice, the attitude you took towards Segundo and his adherents. I think in this country right now, with the political impact of religion around us, um, you know, I, I worked on stories that led to Jonestown in San Francisco. The word cult came to me fairly often in my own head as I read the, the lengths to which these people went. Um, but you never judged them. Did you in your own head? Did you have to kind of hold that down? Did you, how, how, did, you, how did you decide on that voice? Yes, I am very judgmental, <laughs> aren't we all? So, um, and I, I, could see, I could see people reading, I, I can see and there's, you know, it's, it's a choice. You can read the story and think that they are, you know, they are, cultish and um, they're not really but uh, you know if you're not if you're anti if you're very secular and if you care about you know the you know the future of the Jewish people and about how religion is uh, you know uh, you know extremist religious groups are taking hold again not just in Judaism but in Christianity as well you know you'll come to um, a lot of the, a lot of conclusions that are not spelled out in the book that I was very careful not to make my own. And um, I am of, you know, and this is something that we discuss here at the school all the time, and I really love the, the, that we have these conversations about, you know, how much to involve ourselves and what it means to be objective and what it means to not be part of the story, etc. I am older, so I'm, I was trained you know, as you know, I, I was trained to not get myself in the story, and I was trained to always check my. Well, they didn't train you like that, but I always try to check my bias and my own. So, um, and I, I had really good editors when I was growing up as a as a reporter in 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 a very uh, you know scrappy newspaper in Argentina, and. Um, and we were very judgmental and very political, and it was a paper that had a political identity, like happens in most of the world outside of this country. And I embraced that one, but you had to be fair and you had to be, um, to, to, f to find the truth. And so I think, you know, I've made different decisions in different books. In some books, I am very much interpreting, I mean, I'm, you're always interpreting, but you're just saying what you think about things. 
And in this one, I felt, again, that I owe it to the story and to the people who had done, made these decisions because I was so, because, because my political and ideological distance to them was so big, I felt I needed to be an extra effort to not judge them and to really just try to understand. And I think the outcome of that is that the book can be read in three ways. You can read the book af as um, uh, the story of a reader, as Jeff was saying, and somebody who, and it's kind of a Borges story, you know, like a man opens a book, starts reading, and then the book takes over, and the book creates the world for, for him. I, th I, I love that idea. If I were a really great writer, I would have written that book, but I'm a reporter. I can write, but I, c I can't do literature. So, but I think that would that would have been a beautiful book um, to write. It's, it's in there. It's in there. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, kind of. Uh, and then another, the other story is about seeking, you know, seeking truth. And I related. I guess all of us as journalists can hope. I hope we can all relate to that. The idea that you your your goal is to find the truth in something, and it's just so hard because you weren't there. And even if you were there, you're inside your own you know, mind and the limits of human knowledge or, you know, it's just so hard to know exactly what happened and what it means without filtering through your own bias and prejudices and values. And so the fact that he, the Segundo basically dedicated his entire life to really finding the truth about what God was telling him in this book. This is what he wanted to know. And it's not a simple book. It's actually a collection of books that were written in very different moments of in time where you can find a lot of contradictions and a lot of very obscure because they're so old, right? So he really wanted this book to tell them how to worship God and how to live according to God's desires for them. And it took him all his life. And by the time he died, he was, not, he was still looking and he was still changing his mind about what that meant. Um, he doesn't actually, the story doesn't end with him finding Judaism and going to, because when he goes there, he ends up renouncing rabbinical, rabbinical Judaism and looking, going for more, um, you know, radical groups who actually do not follow rabbinical law or the um, oral law. So to me, that was fascinating. So this, uh, that another story, another way to read the book is this, the impossible seek for truth, you know, that you can't, you will never, you can get really close maybe but it's it's not perfect. It's just so hard. Um, and what's the third? You tell me. Yeah, um, I forgot. Just the drama come back. Of it? Yeah, I don't know. There's story. another one. All right, I have one more question. Mm. Um, so you wrote this book in Spanish. Yeah. Then it was translated into English by Lisa Dillman. Yes, that's right. Um, and then as sh as changes were made by the editor, in the, the editor does not speak Spanish, yeah. so he edited it in English. And then as you agreed to changes, you made, the, you made those back in the Spanish version. I have a headache thinking about all that. Um, and for those of you who are guests at the school, Graciela started our uh, bilingual journalism program here, of which we are very proud. And um, so this idea of going back and forth between the two languages, I'm fascinated by that process. I'm fascinated by... Um, how you envisioned the, the sound of the book in your head and how it came out through Lisa Dillman in English. But mostly, uh, so I want to hear about that, but I also want to hear about uh, when I've talked to Latin American journalists, they tell me about different expectations for the story, different expectations for narrative out of, out of um, Gabo and Borges and the different um, heritage of writing that we have here. So I just want you to riff on that for just a minute about r working in the two languages at once. So I, I do journalism in English. I write a column in English and um, I have this flawed, borrowed language that I use to, to work. Um, but my I couldn't imagine writing a book, the full book in Spanish. It's hard enough to do it in your own flawed, you know, language, and, and because writing, to me, writing is really, really hard. Um, um, if you, if, if for people here, writing comes easy, I hate you. <laughs> 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 it's just the hardest thing. I find reporting is fascinating and exciting and really hard, but in a great way, and writing is really hard in a horrible way, and I just hate every moment. It's like pulling teeth, and um, and so I do write in English for, for, for here, and uh, because English is 
the lingua franca, right? And it's like the prevailing language. Um, but but I really still feel in control. I don't feel in control. So I feel in control of only Spanish um, sometimes. So I, I did it. I, I wrote it in Spanish, but I wrote it knowing it was going to be translated. So I think it came out more sparse. I, I write in Spanish kind of in a sparse kind of short sentence way because I read too many American nonfiction uh, growing up. Um, you know, Spanish is more longer sentences, more the you know more convoluted. You for an idea, you use more words. It's beautiful, and it's but it's more. It's like it's like an embrace. I don't know. It's more. Um, to me, there's something emotional about that. That is it's more lyrical. It's right. I had a. I have a. There's a, this reporter um, who tweeted. Uh, she just described it exactly. She said that when she writes an email in English, uh, it's always best and her name, right? And in Spanish, it's always ojalá que hayas pasado una linda semana y que esté todo bien y que te vaya bien y te mando un abrazo. It's like you know, hugs and kisses, and I hope everything is okay and that your family is okay. And so, and you just is is the, the way you feel in the both languages. You would never say those things in English. Oh my God, people will be scared. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? But in Spanish, if you just say saludos, it's like, you know, you're so rude, you know? So there's something about writing the book in that way that it became more um, compact and shorter, probably. Um, and the, the translation process was great because Lisa is a wonderful translator, but also work, works in collaboration. She thinks it really is a collaboration, so we would talk a lot about how to translate it. I have enough English to actually then, you know, make decisions about the words and the translation. And then I, the, the whole edition, the, the editing piece was done in English with my editor, who, as you said, doesn't speak Spanish. Um, and this is for the bilinguals here, for the bilinguals. My fear when I was selling this book here, I got, so I got the fellowship and I got an agent and um, I got Knopf to buy the book and I, I went, I talked to a few editors, he went to auction finally the book and I was like, I was, you know, I had a stomachache, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to just not understand what they're saying or something. I was really scared about the, those meetings because it's like 14 people, the marketing director and they're all asking you questions about your book and the book has been such a personal thing until then and then you have to share with these people who, don't, who just are thinking about the market mostly. And, um, and I prepared for every meeting, I prepared for the language question in my mind which was no one in those tables could speak Spanish. The, 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 the publishing industry is shockingly monolingual and white and so I was always feeling like, the, you know, and, and I always prepare for them saying, well, you know, there's going to be, you, you, can you write it in English? Or they're going to say, how is this going to book? You know, books in translation don't sell. Only 3% of the market, I knew all the numbers, are in translation, sold in translation. Blah, blah. And so I was just thinking they're going to reject it because I can't write it in English. And no one ever asked about the language. No one even cared in which language I was going to write the book. Because the story, they found the story just so compelling, and the way I could, I, I saw the story so compelling that it was not even acknowledged. And so by the time I wrote it, I sent it to my editor, and my editor said, oh, shoot, I can't read this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what did you expect? He's like, I never thought about it. I, was I just wanted the book. So the book sat there for a year until we found a translator. And he was like, I can't read it, and my agent either. So they both had it. They never thought about it the language. So I think that shows that, you know, uh, we need to be bold and daring, and also that the market is changing here, I hope. Questions? Oh, one back. Let's throw it there. Oh. Oh, thank you. Uh, Graciela, thank you so much for this book and for this time and for sharing all your thoughts. You and I have had this conversation at length about just the nature of the own voices movement and how important it is to have writers who come from a certain experience being able to bring that context that it may take rest of us 15 years to actually gather. Um, but I think there's also an, a need for reporters who are willing to be diligent and to, s and to bring these kinds of stories. I think we can both agree that it's unrealistic to expect people who are spending five years to build a single wall for a synagogue to also sit down and write chronicles of their own lives and what's happening. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that about what it means to delve into a story. You've already addressed some of the dimensions of class, race, 
you know, language and all of these other things, but what it means to actually honor the story of another people and to bring it to light in a way that makes it relevant to a broader society. Thank you, Kavita. So um, I think you have to be, I think we failed at it, more, uh, you know, often. I failed in the past, um, for, sh for sure. Um, I think you need to be, I think it's a decision to do that. It's just, it's really, it's, it's a decision and then to check your own process and, um, and to, what I do is I think, what happens if they read it in front of me? If they're sitting here reading this book, um, will they feel like I'm lying or like I'm, you know, or like I'm completely distorting what they, what they did? Um, I think you have to be very, I don't like to surprise people when I write something. I think you need to go back to them and say, this is how I understand it. I've had these really interesting conversations with Segundo's son, um, Yoshua, who's now a rabbi. Um, and and it, the conversations were always, I always started by saying, look, this is not the book of a religious person. I'm not gonna write the book that you would have written or that your father would have written. You're probably not gonna like this book because this book shows your father and your life and your family from an external perspective that is not your perspective, but it's not gonna be, you know, so, but help me get it right. So I think all we can do is try to get it right and go back to the sources. And if we don't understand something, uh, ask again and double check. And, um, but I think it starts by making the decision that you're not going to be so that this is, I, I think what is tricky, and it's tricky when you're teaching how to do this, and I think every professor in the school thinks about this, is that it's your story, so you have to have control on your story. So if this is my book, this is not their book. And I have the right to write a book because that's what we do, because we believe it's important to tell this story because it tells, it, it shows some, some something that we feel it's important to show or to, share and but at the same time it's not them telling the story and to me it helps to just spell that out you know this is not your book write your book actually he's writing his own book and his the family is writing a book or they've been writing it for years i don't know if they're gonna do it um but you know there's 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 a voice in my mind and i think in every r respectable journalist's mind like you know asking you know am i you know, how, how much of this in is about me and how much is about the story and, 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 and the protagonists. So, and there's, you know, like in, in any profession, there's good people and there's people who can do this better and who are more ethical and who, are, who really care about this and some people who just, you know, who don't. Um, and that's not really something you teach. I think what you teach and what I can share is that you have to, you have to, you know, go through this, you have to make this decision that you are going to honor them and you're going to, but you're also gonna tell the truth. And sometimes the truth is not nice. If, some, if, if something writes about us, we might, and, and if, particularly if they tell the truth, it's probably gonna hurt us, right? Because, you know, we don't, we want just a rosy picture. Um, so it's, it's that line that you're always kind of kind of walking on where you want to tell the truth which, which might be not you know um, pretty for for the protagonist of the story but at the same time um, you you do it with respect and just really looking for 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 the truth because you don't want to also distort it just to be nice to people right other questions I'm curious about the first version versus the second. You mentioned, you know, 2006, you finished this first version in Spanish. You mentioned that maybe it was a little premature, but now here you are, you know, 16 years later, more than, you know, it's a long time later. I'm curious what the relationship is, if you actually were able to draw things from that or you kind of just set it aside and started from scratch, um, whether it was helpful to have that early version and made this version better or just what your thoughts are. I wish it could, I could burn every single copy <laughs> of that first one. <laughs> <laughs> That's my honest answer. No, I. I don't like I don't like that book. I tried to do it was an experiment. It was also written as a fable because I didn't have enough 
it's written as a fable of, and I, you know, they didn't mind. They read that. So I had the opportunity. This, this was the one reason why that book was useful and important to, to this book and to their story was that they had, they all read that book and they had the opportunity to um, give me a lot of feedback, what things they felt did not really get them and what things they were happy about. Most of them were happy about it, but because it was a book about them and it was, and it treats them and, and it was, you know, very respectful. And, um, and then a lot of people in the region knew about them through that book. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it, it, it meant something, but um, it really didn't, it doesn't really capture what Segundo did and what they did. There are some pieces that are fine that I, that I took and I still used, um, but most of it I just, just you know, pretended I'd never written it. I'm kind of surprised that you didn't have, at some point, um, say, well, damn, I wish I hadn't done that. Yes, I wish I hadn't done that. But, but, but you went ahead and did the new book anyway, which is, which is fascinating, because when I'm writing the next book I've got to do, I think, should I hold this on for another book? You know, but no, you went ahead and used it both times, which I think is <laughs> instructive. Thank you. Thank you, Graciela, and thank you, Jeff, for this. So, Graciela, you talked a, a, a bit before about kind of the lessons and inspirations that journalists could get from Segundo's story, especially in terms of seeking truth. What lessons do you see there, positive and otherwise, about leadership? It was just amazing in terms of how, what he was to, to able to rally and get other people to do. Right, so thank you, that's a very, um, I'm happy you asked that because that's something that, that's something I didn't get right in the first book. So there was something very, um, so I knew that he was the leader of this group and you know, I thought in very traditional terms as a leader, like El Jefe, you know, like he was the boss of something of this group and he was making all the decisions and it took me a long time. That's one of the, that's part of the feedback that I got after they read the first one to understand that actually he had, he was a very not, he, he was a very um, kind of different kind of leader. The leadership was a collective leadership. So the way they, they saw their, so he's, he's, he's the one who reads the book first and then he of course leads the first, you know, he creates the first reading groups and he brings his family and worker, other, you know, fellow workers and he starts collecting people for this, effort and then they start, you know, creating, they ended up creating a church. Um, but the leadership was um, like a council, like, like a council of elders. They, s they thought of that because they were using models of Protestant churches at one point and I didn't know that. Um, so there's a lot of, he was never, for example, when they become Jewish and they create an association just to, um, you know, they create like a board to to manage to make decisions and and uh, and to make it more kind of professional, he's never the chair of that board. He's always like um, the treasurer, or he has like always, and I couldn't understand why. And and then he was uh, he had a stutter, so he was not like Moses, by the way. Uh, but he he was not um, his leadership was not because he was uh, he was not an intellectual type. He barely finished high school. And uh, and he was not. There were other people in his group who were um, who had been uh, evangelical um, pastors, or and so who were great at talking and just drawing the multitude and just you know inspiring people. He wasn't like that. He was very. He did not. He was not a public speaker. He was not um, that articulate when he was talking, and he had trouble speaking. But everyone in the end followed his lead because he was not, there was no duplicity in him. This is something that they all really appreciated and that had to do with their Catholic experience where they felt the, w the Catholic church was very, there was a hypocrisy there that you know they, they would say things but then their lives didn't reflect those values. And Segundo was the opposite of that. Segundo was exactly what you saw and he was always very, um, very, very strict. He was a terribly strict father and also leader. Uh, people kind of feared him a bit. His children certainly did. 
Um, he wasn't violent, but he was very strict and very, you know, there was no flexibility. Um, and, you know, you had, at one point, they had decided, he had uh, decided, he had realized that you couldn't uh, have, you know, cook with fire on the Shabbat, uh, you know, after Friday, after the sun goes down. And so, and at the beginning, when they, when they became Jewish, uh, the first time, women would keep cooking because the food wasn't ready, and he would come with a, you know, glass of water and just, you know, s just make sure that the flames were off uh, because, and, and they, he didn't care if they ate raw food and if it wasn't ready because the only thing that mattered was to follow God's, you know, uh, commands. And so he was, it took me a while to understand that kind of leadership. So it's a leader who was very strict and very um, rigid, but at the same time, because he was really looking for the truth, they all understood that um, he was not, that he was serious about it, that, you know, they, that, that made people trust him. And then at the same time, he had all these other men who were sharing um, the interpretation piece, which was the main thing they did all, most of the time, just read the book Bible and try to understand how to live according to that. So he would come up with, to who he would understand, you know, there was, for example, they had a long, year-long conversation around circumcision. And if you read the Christian Bible, in Old Testament and New Testament, the Old Testament, it says that circumcision is of the flesh, but the New Testament says that circumcision is of the heart, which means it's symbolic. So for a long time, they would just read all of these. They would discuss, like here, like in a, you know, in a room, and they would all say, cite different passages. And then he or one of the other men would say, okay, no, we go with St. Paul because it says here that it's of the heart because of such and such. So they would not get circumcised, which changed when they decided to be Jewish, of course. Um, but it was fascinating to me to how long it took me to understand that this was the type of leadership that, um, and a lot of things had were decided by his brother, for example, or, or by another man who also came up repeatedly, and I, I couldn't understand what his role was. Um, but that be because it was this shared um, leadership structure. I think we have time for one more question, if we have it up. Uh, I'm going to end with this one. You said this early on in our conversation, that when you went to Israel to, to the settlements, you saw all the women, and then the voices in the book are almost all men. Yes. And as a feminist yourself, uh, how did you grapple with that cultural um, difference? So I realized actually when I wrote the book and I reread it as I was getting ready to send it to my editor, I thought, oh my God, they're all men here talking. And because, the, I, because I focus exclusively on the religious aspect of their lives and their journey. Um, and all of those decisions were made by this group of men. Women did not participate in the decisions around religious and how to interpret the Bible. Uh, all the rabbis were men. All the priests and pastors were men. All the people who helped them were men. And they've all, most of them had talked to me. And I did not see, when I was in Argentina, for example, this is something I would never have seen because there was no awareness about that. And since I moved to, to New York and I started seeing how people check their sources, looking for equity in sources. That was something I started, I've started doing in the past 10 years. I didn't do it before. And I didn't realize I had done that with the book. And I thought, oh my God, you know. And so there, of course there, there are women there, of course, you know, there, there, but they, were, they had a very, um, you know, and, they are, and there's, there's a story on how Segundo, you know, converted his wife, who was the first, you know, skeptic. And uh, the daughters are there and all the women are in the book, but they are not driving the story because they were not. So I just didn't know what to do with that. And I called a few reporters who are great investigative reporters and I said, and writers, and I said, what, what do I do with this? Should I start over and just do a book where I talk about other things where woman, women had a, a, a place, but it would just completely distort the story I wanted to tell. And a friend of mine who has a lot of experience said, acknowledge it, you know, just don't 
pretend it didn't happen. Just so it's in the source chapter, I just start saying this. And I said also, part of what happened is that Segundo's daughters then at one point decided they would not talk to me. They would let the men tell the story because they didn't have the authority to tell the story. I don't know what else to, that to do with that. Graciela, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it.